Welcome to a discussion devoted to ethics in AI education, the latest in our growing series of seminars associated with the exciting new Institute for Ethics in AI at the University of Oxford. I'm Peter Millikan, Gilbert Ryle Fellow and Professor of Philosophy at the Hartford College, Oxford, and I'll be chairing tonight's event. As artificial intelligence increasingly impacts on so many aspects of our lives, there's recently been hugely increased awareness of the importance of putting ethical considerations at the center of AI development. But for this to happen in any sustainable and wide, widespread way, it's crucial that ethics becomes established as a key part of AI education. So that is the focus of our seminar tonight. I'm delighted to be joined by three young academics who've put a lot of thought into this area, and they will speak in turn, after which we'll have a discussion and questions. First up is Milo Phillips-Brown, currently at MIT, but soon to join us here at Oxford. Hi there. Second is Helena Webb, who's been teaching AI ethics in the Department of Computer Science here. Hello. And finally, Max Van Cleek, who's been working alongside Helena and will be focusing particularly on the challenges that such teaching involves. Each of our speakers will talk for about 15 or 20 minutes and the event as a whole will last for 90 minutes. So we'll have plenty of time for discussion and you're very welcome to offer your own questions to the speakers. So please do and please feel free to do this at any time. So as if questions occur to you as the speakers are speaking, put them into the comments box on YouTube and in due course, uh, I'll be bringing those into the discussion. Uh, so we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to learn from your ideas. Okay, so uh, first, as I said, is Milo Phillips-Brown. Uh, Milo is currently Distinguished Fellow in Ethics and Technology at MIT and Senior Research Fellow in Digital Ethics and Governance at the Jane Family Institute. I'm delighted that Milo is going to be joining us shortly uh, in, in, after Christmas as Associate Professor of Philosophy and Tutorial Fellow at Jesus College. So his is one of uh, the important new appointments that's come about because of the new Institute for Ethics in AI. Uh, as part of his job here, he will be teaching uh, AI ethics in the Department of Computer Science. So he's absolutely on this key interface between philosophy and computer science, which uh, we're so keen on here at Oxford. Milo's led various efforts across MIT in creating ethics curricula for STEM students. For example, he's developed and taught ethics material for a wide range of STEM classes, focusing, focusing especially on the ethics of technology and on developing two completely new courses, a workshop in ethical engineering and experiential ethics. So we're looking very forward very much to seeing what Milo does when he comes and teaches ethics here in Oxford. Over to you, Milo. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, really glad to be here and looking forward to this conversation with Helena and Max. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen now um, and give a little bit of a talk. So how's that, how's that looking? Can you see it? Okay, great. So I'm gonna be talking about goals for ethical engineering pedagogy. And in particular, this slogan to get students ready, willing, and able to engineer ethically. Okay, so as Peter alluded to, the, the news is bleak and familiar. Technologies are going awry all over the place. And this has called, this has caused many calls for action, prominent among them that engineering students, computer science students in particular, need to be trained in ethics so that history does not repeat itself. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is what it is that we should be doing or can be doing and might have difficulty doing in reaching this goal. So here's a brief overview plan of the plan of the talk. So I'm gonna start talking about the learning objectives for ethics pedagogy for engineering students. How do we get students to be at that point where history 
doesn't repeat itself. And this question, kind of attending to it carefully with that particular goal in mind, reveals, I think, a different picture of what we ought to be doing in teaching AI ethics than sort of the traditional approach in engineering ethics more generally. And so that leads into the second topic, which is how it is that we reach these new learning objectives. And so I'm gonna talk a bit, give you a preview of the kind of things that I've been doing with my collaborators across MIT, and then close to talk a bit more about what the obstacles are to reaching these objectives. All right, let's jump in. Learning objectives. So we said that the sort of like the, the, the long-term goal is to have students graduate from their graduate programs or undergraduate programs. And once they sort of enter the real world to not be creating the mistakes of the past. What that means is that we want them ultimately to be doing something, to be engineering ethically. And so if they're going to be able to do those, if they're going to do those things, then they need to be taught, we think, two different things. One is to be able to do the things that we want them to do, to be able to identify, address, and communicate about the ethical dimensions of their work and also to be ready and willing, which is to say motivated to do these things. So these we think of as the learning objectives. What we want our students to do is have the ability to do something and the willingness to do it. If they just happen to know a lot about ethics but have no idea how to translate that into your, their practice, if they're not able to practice ethical engineering, then it won't really matter, nothing will change. Similarly, even if they're able, know exactly what to do, but aren't motivated to do it, nothing will change. So this is what we're shooting for. How do we get there? How are we going to reach these objectives? Well, start with this idea of trying to get students able to engineer ethically. What we think is that the best way to get this is the idea of teaching ethics as a skill. Quite literally, teaching them to be able to engineer ethically. So what does that mean exactly? Well, at the core of the approach is to teach concrete methods for ethical engineering, something that you can sit down in practice in designing a technology and take steps to understand what the ethical implications are and how to go forward. So here we draw on large research fields and programs. So the field of responsible innovation, for example, or research programs in value sensitive design or participatory design. There are people who have been working on these questions for decades. What can you do in practice to build technologies that are more responsible? The answer to those questions are the things that we want to teach students. And indeed, that's what we have been teaching students across MIT. So one of the things that we've been doing is teaching um, integrating ethics into technical curriculum. So my team has done about like 12 or 17 different classes across MIT doing this. I'm just gonna talk you through a little bit about one of those. And so it's a class called Software Studio in the computer science department where students learn the fundamentals of software design. And for each assignment in this class, each technical assignment, we've worked with the uh, technical instructors to integrate ethical material. And this is an example of one such assignment. So in the course, they are learning software design by building a toy version of Twitter, which they call Fritter, because you're frittering your time away. So they'll have this set of questions, uh, a problem set in a traditional, you know, uh, computer science class, and alongside them, there will be questions about the ethical implications of the decisions they might be making in their design choices. So, for example, we'll ask a question such as, if your sole goal in creating Fritter were to get children addicted to the technology, what design decisions you make? Or similarly, if your sole goal were to try to make it as difficult as possible for someone who's not very tech literate, what decisions you would you make? Or if your sole goal was to prevent the spread of disinformation on the platform, what would you make? 
So the idea here is to sort of use these kind of creative and hopefully somewhat fun prompts to get the students to try to investigate how the decisions that they're already making, you're making these decisions in building a platform. How are the decisions that you're already making value laden? How do they have ethical implications? And so this is just sort of one of the concrete steps that is sort of core to things such as value sensitive design is revealing where sort of what might look like value neutral or purely engineering decisions in fact have ethical consequences. And that's a skill, figuring out exactly what those things are when you're setting down to build a technology. Okay, so, and again, that, that's just one example of the kinds of things we're doing. Happy to and keen to talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, one thing I alluded to, I advertised at the beginning was that this sort of approach, the learning objectives that we're advocating for um, and are no, by, by no means new to us, although we sort of have our own spin on it. But in any case, the approach that we're advocating for does, does break somewhat from a kind of traditional approach to engineering ethics pedagogy. And that traditional approach, which you'll find in kind of engineering textbooks, engineering ethics textbooks, and also in the sort of more, um, more current movement to get AI ethics uh, into computer science classrooms is based in moral theory, basically. Like we teach students kind of bite-sized versions of what they might learn in a philosophy classroom. We teach them philosophical distinctions, hopefully philosophical distinctions that have some connection to some technological issue, but at root sort of the idea is to teach a bit of philosophy. We think that philosophy has a place for sure in uh, ethics engineering education, but it shouldn't be the focus. That's the idea anyway. The reason is that philosophy is not, nor is it usually meant to be applicable in practice. The kinds of questions that philosophers find interesting, even in AI ethics, are often not ones that are going to be the kind of thing that a computer science student is going to be wrestling with, you know, on day one of their, their new job working for a tech company. So that's one issue is that the, the, the topics that philosophers are concerned with are often sort of not directly relatable to what the engineer is doing in practice. The second issue is even when they are, you're still dealing in the realm of theory. So the student might learn a little bit of theory that relates to what they're thinking about, but how do they apply that to practice? Let's do that work for them. Let's teach them directly what they do in practice and have them build that skill. Okay, and I say this as a philosopher, I'm a philosopher by training. Um, this is no knock on philosophy. This is just trying to think of what is the best way to reach that outcome where students are able to engineer ethically. Okay, now all that said, there is certainly a place um, and a necessary role for kind of complementary ways of thinking from the humanities and social sciences when we think about exercising ethics as a skill. One thing you learn in a philosophy classroom when you're studying ethics or political or social philosophy is a certain kind of moral reasoning or a certain kind of awareness of, of moral facts that you might not appreciate otherwise. That's important, those things make you better when we're thinking about how good you are as practicing ethics as a skill. Similarly, understanding the sort of historical lineage of a certain kind of technology can help you better understand how that technology fits within a socio-technical system. We don't engineer in vacuums. Students need to understand how what they're doing operates within a broader system and there's plenty of work in the humanities and social sciences that will help them understand that. So the approach here is one sort of where at the core, we teach methods of responsible engineering. 
And kind of complementing that and interconnecting with that are these methods and insights from the humanities and social sciences. And of course, there are technical elements to this too. Um, but in some ways, that, that goes without saying. All right. So that is the means to reach what we're thinking of this first objective, is to get students to be able to engineer ethically. The second objective is, remember, for them to be ready and willing to do so for them to be motivated to do so. Okay, how do you go about doing that? This I think is a really difficult question and kind of in, in some ways a matter of, you know, really sort of like behavioral psychology, but there are some things that we think we can do that push us at least in this direction. And the, the kind of the key words or the, the catchphrases we're thinking of are to help students develop an interest in and proximity to ethics. So for students to think ethics relate to what I do as a computer scientist, to what I do as somebody who's making a technology, not to what's just happening in the news, like that's not my problem. And for them to not only feel like it's proximal, but like they care about it. Like, yeah, this is something related to what I do and I wanna be involved in it. I, it's, it's not just a not my problem type thing. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, one of the things we've already seen a bit, um, as I mentioned, a lot of the work is integrating ethics curriculum into computer science classes that relates directly to the technical material that the students are working on. That develops a sense of proximity. If you're seeing in your own homework, as you're learning to be an engineer, how the engineering decisions you're making have ethical consequences, you're seeing the proximity between engineering and ethics. So this sort of integrating or embedding approach, which goes back you know, 30 years at the University of Twente in particular, this is something that's been going on for a long time, is I think particularly well suited to developing this sense of proximity. Here's another thing that we can maybe do to engender the sense of proximity is a class my colleagues and I developed, uh, there's, a, there's a link to the syllabus there, a class that we developed and piloted last, this past summer with uh, 70 students at MIT. And the primary learning objective of the course was just to get students to be more interested in ethics. And the idea is that we would try to do so by allowing them to come to ethics on their own terms and by way of their own experiences. So, so here's what that means. The, the class had no lecture. Rather, the students were, would meet in groups of about five with a graduate facilitator each week they would talk about some topic that, that we assigned. We would have readings and short assignments, but the, the sort of the trajectory of the discussion would be very much driven by them. What did they want to talk about? What were they interested in? So there's no one standing out of front of the class saying, ethics matters. You're making a technology. You're doing a bad thing. Here's all these ways that technology is bad, to use a caricature. Rather, we're trying to present them with ethical issues and let them explore it, to come to it on their own terms. And then the experiential part of experiential ethics, the idea that the students will do this specifically based on their own experiences. So we connected this to the internships or undergraduate research opportunities that students were doing at MIT and encourage them to reflect on those in, for example, their final projects. So one student wa who was working at a law tax firm over the summer did a final project about racial inequality in the US tax system. So that's experiential ethics. Um, what's another way to try to get students interested in ethics? Well, we have to be open-minded. Like there are a lot of interesting things, questions in philosophy, in policy, in the humanities, technical questions. There are all sorts of really rich and interesting questions about ethics of technology, about the social implications and history of technology. Let's just try to get students interested in those things. So here's one example, of course I taught, that was just a pretty straight up applied or practical ethics course in the ethics of technology. We didn't do so much of the responsible innovation. That wasn't the point. We were teaching philosophy. 
And this is the kind of thing that some students got really excited about it. And that's great because we want to get students engaged in this. We want to get students motivated to do sort of the ethical thing, to engineer responsibly. And so we need to be creative here and not be dogmatic. Let's follow what the students are interested in and give that to them so that they develop this sense of proximity and interest. Okay, so that's the big picture. Uh, ready, willing, and able. We want students to have this skill of engineering ethically, and we want them to be motivated to do it. This is a hard thing to do though. And so we're gonna close a little bit and talk about some obstacles. So it, it's no surprise really, genuine change in students' readiness, willingness, and ability requires dedication to ethics curriculum. You don't change the way somebody is motivated to do something overnight, especially when that thing is often gonna sort of potentially come at some personal or professional cost once they're sort of maybe advocating for an ethical outcome in the workplace. That takes time. So does developing a skill. We spend a whole undergraduate career teaching someone how to be an engineer. The skill of engineering takes time to learn. So too does the skill of ethical engineering. It doesn't come overnight. And so that need for sort of significant dedication raises obstacles. For one, it means that there'll be less technical material in the curriculum. There are only so many hours in the day. There are only so many hours in uh, education. And if you're teaching students more ethics, then something else has to go. And in many cases, that will be the technical material. So there's a tension there. There's also sort of the institutional obstacles, which are that you need people you need sort of a workforce to teach ethical engineering practices um, and insights from the humanities and social sciences. That's the kind of thing that needs to be funded. These people need to be able to work with the technical instructors. It's a non-trivial endeavor, especially when you're trying to do it at a scale where we're really going to change how the students are ready, willing, and able to engineer responsibly. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, I think you're muted. Thank you very much, Milo. That was extremely interesting. Uh, could I just try pushing back a little bit against uh, some of the what you said there? So you've got the idea of uh, teaching ethics as a skill and, and, and one of the things you're doing there is encouraging students to produce this fritter, this toy version of Twitter, and you can give them different aims there. Now, I can imagine that some students might think, wow, uh, getting the users to be addicted to it, isn't that cool? Or producing something that will make misinformation go viral. Wow, how exciting. Because I think, you know, a lot of the the people who, who end up writing computer viruses, part of the appeal there is to write something cool that's going to just go around the place. And they don't think very much about the ethical implications. Now, I can imagine somebody saying that if you focus on ethics as a skill in the way you've described and neglect, as it were, the classic moral philosophy, the risk is you're not actually giving them a reason to care about being moral. Um, so how would you respond to that? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if you get students, it, these things are a double-edged sword. Um, the technology, just sort of showing them what the technology can do doesn't push them in one direction or another. But I do think that is sort of like a core idea in terms of getting them to see what design decisions will result in which outcomes heads off this problem that we often talk about, which is like an unforeseen or unintended consequence. People are building something and they don't understand what ethical implications they might have because they don't even understand what might happen. They're not sort of thinking creatively about that. So sort of a couple of points to sort of build on that. One is that we don't tr just try to get them to think about like, how would you abuse the system in this way? We also sort of give them some tools to think through what, what we call sort of moral lenses of think through different sort of ethical aspects of the possible 
effects that they're going to be having. Um, and we don't think for the most part that you have to do moral theory to get people on to what are different sort of salient ethical aspects. There is often, in my experience at MIT at least, a very strong sort of like consequentialist mindset in computer mm -hmm. science students. Mm -hmm. So there's a ways to sort of disabuse them of that, which is not to say that consequences don't matter without sort of, you know, teaching them all three formulations of the categorical imperative. There are sort of different ways to do that that don't get into the theory. And then there's the other question you raise, which is just how do you teach them to be moral? So, okay, now they're really attuned to these ways in which they can sort of addict their users or do bad things and are they're gonna make more money by doing that. Well, that's where the sort of the willingness and motivation comes in. And maybe is, is, it not, is it not uh, plausible that some of that willingness and motivation could come from discussing issues like uh, universalizability, you know, my, your interests are as important as mine from an objective point of view, or virtue ethics or moral psychology. In other words, doing some more traditional moral philosophy might actually help to motivate them. I think it absolutely can. And so this is the sort of this idea that I was trying to articulate at the end, which is that when we think especially about the mode, like we can really separate the skill building point where moral philosophy, I think has a much smaller role because a lot of these are like looking at a technology and understanding the space of alternatives. Who are your stakeholders? What are the decisions that I'm making? So that's more on the skill side, but on the motivation side, we have to be flexible. We have to figure out what works and it might be different in different Places. So some students might get really excited about the moral theory and that's their way in. And that's fantastic. And other students might get excited by the history of it or, you know, understanding, you know, what the corporate culture at Google is like. We have to sort of be flexible in that way. And I do think that moral theory is a great way in like this ethics of technology class that was a practical applied ethics class. Students got more excited the engineering students at MIT got more excited, like expressed this about ethical engineering in their own work, even though we weren't teaching responsible engineering practices. We were okay, teaching so, philosophy. So that's yeah. interesting. So, so bringing in the ethics um, as a skill could quite independently of, uh, of other value actually be useful in motivating an interest in ethics. I think so, yeah. yeah. So I they, think, yeah. yeah. Because I, I, I imagine there is a tendency for computer science in general to think of ethics classes as rather orthogonal to their main interests. So, uh, yeah. well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Milo. That's that's fascinating. Uh, let's now hear from Helena. Um, Helena Webb is senior researcher in the human centered computing theme at the Department of Computer Science. Her research has been highly interdisciplinary involving a range of projects to investigate the impacts of computing on social life and the lived experience of technology. Together with Max, uh, Max Van Cleek, who will be speaking uh, next, Helena developed and delivered a new compulsory course for undergraduates in the Department of Computer Science on ethics and responsible innovation. And the course ran for the first time last year. It's currently being delivered for the second time. As part of her work in the human-centered human computing theme, Helena also contributes to a number of wider education initiatives, which she'll talk about in her presentation. So Helena, we'll be really interested to hear what you've learned from uh, this year and something of uh, teaching ethics in Oxford to computing students and, and your other uh, outreach initiatives. Over to you. Uh Thank you very much. It, it's really great to have the opportunity to be part of this discussion today. And I'll just share my screen. Hopefully that's come up okay. Fantastic. Um, yes, so uh, as Peter mentioned, I'm a, a senior researcher and I work 
in the Department of Computer Science as part of a group, a research theme called Human Centered Computing. So we are an interdisciplinary group of researchers and we carry out projects that examine the impact that contemporary computing systems have on individuals, communities and societies. And our work tries to identify ways that these innovations can be ethical and better support human flourishing. So ethics is central to a lot of what we do, often with a very applied focus. And this focus often involves um, an interest in education in both formal ways and non-formal ways. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about two things. So first of all, I'm going to talk about some of the education initiatives that I've been involved in as part of our work in the human centered computing theme. And in particular, that takes place as part of projects that we carry out that are underpinned by the initiative known as Responsible Innovation, the initiative that Milo has already mentioned in his talk previously. And then I'm going to talk about the undergraduate module that Max and I developed on ethics and responsible innovation at the we delivered for the first time last year here in the Department of Computer Science at Oxford. So most of the projects that I'm involved in as part of the human centered computing theme are underpinned by the initiative known as Responsible Innovation. And this is an initiative that has developed a great deal of traction in academia, industry and policy in the UK and the EU and more broadly in the last 10, 15 years or so. And the idea of responsible innovation is to bring together actors across society to work together during the entire research and innovation process. So you bring together researchers, scientists, citizens, policymakers, businesses, third sector organizations, and so on. Bring them together so they can engage with each other and talk about an innovation, talk about the potential consequences, both positive and negative that it might have, and identify ways to address those consequences early in the, the life cycle of the innovation process. So it's about finding out ways to try to mitigate the potential negative consequences of an innovation before it's implemented. So the idea is that if you bring together these stakeholders to work together, you can produce better outcomes. You can ensure that innovations meet the values of society, meet societal needs and interests. So this responsible innovation perspective really emphasizes stakeholder engagement and the sharing of understandings. So it's a form of ethics being carried out in very practical ways, and it naturally brings in some educational elements as well. So education to focus on good practice and innovation or ethics and innovation. So in our group, we carry out a number of activities that come under the umbrella of education in formal and informal ways. And that might focus specifically on ethical AI or might focus more broadly on ICT and digital technologies. So I'm just going to mention a few of the activities that fall under this umbrella of, of education in, in different forms. So the first of these is Orbit, which is an organization that is an observatory for responsible innovation in ICT. And this observatory provides um, training consultancy and research. So at the moment, um, Orbit is involved in the training of doctoral students across the UK. And this is seen as something that's highly important. So we have these doctoral students who are just starting out on postgraduate post work um, on various issues around science and technology and innovation. And here we have an opportunity to embed in them as they begin that training, understandings of ethics in practice, of responsibility, and to think about how they'll carry out in their own work. And then they can take it forward as they go through their careers, if it's into further research, if it's in science and industry and so on. So it's a valuable opportunity to embed ethical understandings right at the start of their journey. Another initiative um, that I was involved in concerned one particular project, and this was the Unbiased Project. So this was a project that looked at algorithms. So controversies around potential bias and algorithmic systems, questions of fairness and algorithmic systems. So in this project, one of the outcomes that we produced was a fairness toolkit. And this toolkit has various resources that are available for stakeholders of all kinds to help them to reflect on issues about, about bias and algorithms, about fairness and algorithmic systems, and what we can do to promote and foster fairness in these systems.
So one of the elements of the toolkit is shown on the slide here, and this is a set of awareness cards. So the cards have different exercises and different pieces of information on them. So they have exercises to take you through the processes of designing an algorithm, deciding what pieces of information go into an algorithm. Or they have exercises to help people consider what kind of values might we want to be embedded into an algorithmic system, or what kind of values would we want that system to uphold. So these toolkits are available as physical and digital copies for a wide number of stakeholders. And we've sent them out and they've been used with students, with professionals in all kinds of areas. So design, science, law, and so on. And they're a really great opportunity for groups to engage together in discussion and foster this kind of critical thinking about algorithmic systems and also help people to feel empowered to make better informed choices about decisions about how they interact with algorithmic systems. So this is, an, um, this is an example of some kind of on, informal education, wider engagement and educational opportunity. And other activities that we've carried out across a number of our projects is the ethical hackathon. So this um, is a slight twist on the traditional idea of the hackathon and computer scientists and engineering students are, are very familiar with a hackathon model in which you compete together in small teams to face some kind of design challenge. It's a fun competition, it's a chance to exercise various skills and so on. In an ethical hackathon, we make our teams interdisciplinary. So we bring together teams of computer scientists, engineers, social scientists, philosophers, lawyers, and they all work together. And the idea is that they can share expertise and share experiences amongst each other. We also make the design challenge something that's less focused on the technical and more thinking about ethical issues. So for instance, in some of the ethical hackathons that we've run, we've set students a challenge to say that you're developing a new social network and you're committed to the responsible use of algorithms. How are you going to do that? So first of all, the team would need to work together to set out the ethos that their network would have. And then they'd need to think about practical steps to put that ethos into action. So it's a challenge for them to think about, to identify first of all, these ethical and responsibility issues, and then to try to translate them into practical steps. So the students learn from each other, from the different skill sets that they have, and we also incorporate some formal teaching sessions into the um, hackathons as well, so they have that more formal teaching element too. And as Milo was saying in some of the work that he's been doing, the emphasis is on creativity and fun. So these hackathons are designed to be fun encounters. Students get to learn from each other. They enjoy spending time with each other. Um, they present on their ideas and there are prizes available for the best ones at the end of the event as well. So those are some examples of some of the wider educational initiatives that we've been involved in as part of the human-centered computing theme. Now I'll talk specifically about the module that Max and I developed here for, here for the um, computer science students in our department. So in our department, in computer science at Oxford, ethics hasn't traditionally been taught as a core subject. And sometimes it's difficult for our students to see it as an issue that's relevant to their own studies, because a lot of the teaching that goes on in computer science here is quite formal. It's quite mathematical. So they don't necessarily see it as something that's relevant to what they're doing. However, after a period of time spent talking to the department, we had the opportunity to run a course. And this was put on for the first time last year and made compulsory for our first year undergraduates. The aim of the course was to introduce the students to core ethical principles and normative theories and to deepen their understanding of ethical challenges in contemporary computer science. So we did spend time talking to them about moral philosophy and different normative um, theories. And we also talked about certain contemporary issues around AI around data surveillance and so on. We introduced ideas of responsible innovation and other practice-based approaches. So we talked to them about value sensitive design, also about corporate social responsibility and, and other kinds of practical approaches. Now, what we wanted to do was introduce these conceptual ideas, but also very strongly encourage critical reflection from the students as well, to get them to think about how they understood these issues and how they could see them as relevant to their own, their own work and their own activities. So we ran the course as a series of lectures followed up by seminar sessions. Um, 
So in the seminar sessions, the students work together in small groups. These are obviously from last year when it was possible for them to be close to each other. Um, so the students work together in, in small groups and we gave them tasks that required them to draw on all the elements that we'd covered in the course and try to apply them practically. So for instance, we might give them a task where they had to imagine that they were the head of an organization and that organization was bringing in an AI tool for recruitment that could you know, work through CVs or uh, uh, decide who might be employed for a certain role and so on. So their task might be to consider how can that organization make sure that they use that AI system ethically? What challenges might they face? What kind of steps should they put in place to make sure that there's no bias in the system, that humans in HR aren't worried about losing their jobs and so on. So the seminars themselves had a very kind of practical focus, thinking about translating these more conceptual ideas into practices and, and really challenging the students to reflect on their own understanding of these issues and how they themselves saw, see them as being put into practice. And this includes encouraging them to see conflicts where they might arise. So the ways in which sort of ethical concerns and ideas about upholding values can sometimes come into conflicts with the economic imperative and, and the profit motive. So we worked a lot on identifying those kind of tensions and those challenges and talking about different kind of ways, different solutions you might find to those challenges. So I know that Max is going to talk a bit further um, about the course and some of the, the challenges that arise in, in teaching these issues to students. So I won't say much more about it there. But just to finish, I'm going to quickly talk about the, the three key issues that, that Peter was saying uh, we want to cover in this discussion. So the first of those issues was what are our learning objectives if we're teaching AI ethics? And I would agree with Milo in the importance of a very grounded approach to it, one that taps into the experiences of those that you're talking to as being a really helpful way in to getting people to understand these kind of issues. The other question was, um, what are the suitable means to meet those objectives? And I think there are many different means that we can use. So they can be formal teaching methods in classroom situations, or they can be very informal as well. They can be incorporated into other kinds of activities and you can be teaching AI ethics, even if the people that you're teaching aren't students, they might be stakeholders you're engaging in in other kinds of activities. And then the final question that we were given concerned the obstacles. And I know the discussion will focus on this a great deal because there are a wide number of obstacles to truly being successful in this kind of teaching. So I'll just very briefly offer a few here. I think one obstacle, one challenge that we've already mentioned is showing the relevance to people. Why should I care about this thing? Why you know, can't the ethicists just do it and I don't need to worry about it? I can focus on my computing or my engineering. Another challenge is avoiding ethics becoming just a tick box approach that's just done and kind of siloed off from the rest of the curriculum. And then a further challenge is bringing in an interdisciplinary perspective, um, because I think there is a great deal of, of ways in which ethics and social sciences and law, et cetera, can combine in this kind of teaching, but genuinely bringing in um, that interdisciplinarity can be quite difficult to achieve. So those are the challenges that I'm going to offer here and look forward to discussing later on as well. Thank you very much, Helena. Uh, that, that was very interesting indeed. Um, just pointing up a, a contrast of your approach um, with Milo's, you did bring as it were, traditional ethical theory in. So you were telling them about what, deontological views and consequentialist and virtue ethics and so on. Um, did you find the students engaged with that or did they turn off? I think they did. I would say that they did engage with it. And I think what's very helpful um, is actually to use those theories and say, you know, you use these positions all of the time. So you know, if you think about when you have discussion with your friends about, oh, should we have driverless cars or, you know, what's the solution to the trolley problem and all of that kind of stuff, the arguments that they make, they naturally pull on these consequentialist and deontological positions without people necessarily realizing it. And I think actually, if you can make that point, it can be a very useful way of showing to people, you know, ethics isn't just this sort of philosophical thing that, that people do in a room and they're, they're stroking their beards. Actually, ethics is something that we engage with all of the time. So I think it can make a, a very useful teaching point to, to bring in those perspectives. Yeah, okay. So you, I mean, Descartes would like this. You start from the particular and move to the general and yeah. <laughs> you say, look, here you are thinking in this way. And yeah. if, you, if you think through the implications of it, it's gonna lead you in, a, in as it were, an ethical direction or the yeah. direction of 
things that have underlied, been seen as underlying ethics. Um, one other question, I mean, this is obviously very new. I mean, ethics is coming in across the world in AI teaching in a way that it, it, it previously hasn't been. Um, are there any outcomes of this that you've not expected, where you, you, you've tried things and, you know, been rather surprised by the outcome? Oh, I think that one of the things that I, I find um, very rewarding about this kind of teaching in, in general is you can't always predict the, the things that people will take away from it. So for our course, we ask students to, to write up some reflections at the end of the course and, and write about how they might use these ideas going forward. And some of the things that they wrote were really, uh, really rewarding because they talked about kind of other activities, you know, uh, extracurricular activities that they're involved in and how they're gonna use those ideas in that work going forward. And that wasn't, you know, necessarily one of our core teaching objectives, but it was really fantastic to see them seeing the relevance of that and, and taking it forwards. And similarly, we find with the sort of the broader, even the, the non-formal uh, teaching that we're engaged in, it's often used in ways that we don't anticipate. Uh, so with our unbiased cards, they've been used by a much broader range um, of people than we first anticipated. And that's led us actually to develop extensions to them. So, so my colleagues who worked on the project have developed further materials um, for facilitators using those cards, and also um, an AI for decision makers toolkit, um, which has just come out as well, which I was supposed to mention um, when I had the slide <laughs> up with the, uh, with the URL for the project. So I'll just mention it now. And if anybody would like more information about it, they can get in contact with me and I'll pass it on. But I think that's a fantastic thing about um, when you're doing these in engagement and education things is, is the kind of the abduction, you know, what people take away from it isn't necessarily what you set out in your core objectives. It can be something, something else as well. And it's because, you know, people are seeing it through the lens of their own experiences and their own interests. So it can have many more positive benefits than you initially set out for them to have. Well, thank you very much. That's really interesting. Um, and now on to your collaborator. Max Van Keek is Associate Professor of Human Computer Interaction at the Department of Computer Science and a Fellow of Kellogg College in Oxford. Uh, he, like uh, Milo, he has a background in MIT. And while studying at MIT, he was a research assistant at the MIT AI Lab, the Media Lab and the Computer Science and AI Lab. So, uh, so he ended up studying under some of AI's most influential founding fathers, including Rodney Brooks and Marvin Minsky. That's quite enviable, Max. <laughs> Since moving to the UK, first at Southampton and then at Oxford, Max has worked closely with Sir Nigel Shadbolt, who chairs the steering committee for the new Ethics in AI Institute. So, so Nigel has, has really led that charge and have played a huge role in getting the new institute started. Uh, since last year, as we've heard, Max has been teaching ethics and responsible innovation along with Helena, and uh, they developed that course together from scratch. And uh, you're going to focus, uh, oh, actually, I've just noted a rather whimsical thing. At MIT, Max, I, I understand you used to be an electronic music DJ with a dark bot radio show delivering <laughs> sad robot music designed to soothe lonely robots. Is that true? Y yes, see, I spent so much time in robot labs that I deserve, I, I, I believe that they deserved, a, a, you know, an acoustic accompaniment. So I ended up um, becoming an electronic <laughs> music DJ with WMBR, MIT Radio. Excellent, right, well, over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and uh, yes, um, thank you um, as well to the um, the Institute. Um, ever since uh, the Institute was founded, I was excited to get involved. There have been there were some excellent seminars last term uh, about AI ethics. Um, and the reason that I, I am you know so keen to be uh, uh, to give this talk here is twofold. First of all. Um, you know, this is a very, uh, this is an area which is fast moving and, and incredibly important um, as the pace of AI and technology has continued to accelerate. Uh, the, the pace at which new ethical 
problems and concerns are, are arising is also correspondingly seeming to accelerate. Um, and so uh, that uh, is a major reason for it. The reason why I think it's excited, interesting, exciting to talk about education is that in response to these emerging uh, issues, there have been a huge number of different courses and curriculum curricula that have been proposed across uh, the world. A lot of my collaborators in the US, for example, um, have put their syllabi online. Um, and I think it's very important now to start conversations about how best to go about this endeavor to try to um, you know, to try to under, to teach ethics, to to uh, to integrate it uh, throughout various engineering and computer science curricula, and that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about today. Uh, so I uh, um, was uh, asked by Helena to uh, to take part in the design of a new module, as you've just heard. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about that here. The name of my talk is Victims of Algorithmic Violence. Now, this is meant to reflect the fact that sooner or later, because of the fact that algorithms are now going everywhere, you or someone that you care about is going to be a, a victim of some sense of algorithmic violence. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, the Let's see if my slides can work. There we go. Um, so the, a brief map of this talk, I'll first talk about a background about, of the course um, and why um, I was so interested in teaching it. Um, I'll briefly describe, fill in the gaps a little bit of uh, the details of what Helena and I jointly decided uh, would make an appropriate first course. Again, this we were very much alpha testing this course, and we're um, very keen to iterate it and make it better um, over time. And what we want, I want to do is go over a brief overview of our objectives there. And then um, I want to talk for a moment about reflection. So how well it, it worked, uh, challenges that we encountered, and student reactions. Um, and then uh, end on talking about, so what now? You know, where can we go next? Um, so uh, I usually begin my, my talks with a brief content warning. We will be mentioning a number of, of uh, spicy issues here. Uh, if any of these things are of uh, topics that are sensitive to you, then um, you may consider uh, not tuning in for the next 10 minutes while I talk about them. Uh, but anyway, yes. So let's first talk about why um, I got so interested in trying to teach this class and joining Helena on this mission. Um, the reason is um, not only because um, I help lead a group that is looking at uh, the design of ethical AI technology, but because it seems that every week we have new egregious examples of ways that uh, technical systems are doing uh, you know, unbelievably terrible things. <laughs> and, you know, just to mention an example from last week, here is the example of the Twitter image cropping algorithm. Uh, and the, uh, the, the just to explain what this, what this problem was, was the twi Twitter is, is you know, uh, the world's most popular sort of microblogging platform. And um, it has this problem that tweets are this big, so they're very, quite small. Um, and so if you upload images to share in a tweet, it has to figure out how to align the images so that you can see uh, the bits, uh, you know, so it can get sort of uh, a bit of it visible and then you can click on it to see the rest. So somebody discovered, a researcher discovered last week that um, um, if you upload uh, photos of people and uh, one person, um, for example, Mitch McConnell and the other person, Barack Obama, and you, uh, you, have, you create the images artificially to be long and narrow um, so that the image cropping algorithm has to then uh, try to figure out a crop and you permute them. Um, what do you think the image cropping algorithm would do? Well, a very sensible thing would be to just take the middle, for example, and what you end up with is an image that's just white or blank for both of them. But what the algorithm was found to do, in fact, was always choose Mitch McConnell instead of Barack Obama. Now, the reason why it was later sort of uh, you know, explained by Twitter was that they were trying to figure out how to make crop the image to maximize salience. And the data set that they were using to do that one what had more faces of white Caucasian nature than of black uh, or darker skinned people. And this is, you know, just one of the many examples. Um, we also have like, you know, plenty of other examples of devices that work less well for 
for those who are darker skinned or who are, who are not white because of these same kind of unbalances, imbalances in the data sets that people are using. Now, these are, these are terrible examples because what happens is that it, are, it exacerbates, makes worse, and in, in some cases, quite literally promotes the erasure of marginalized groups, members of marginalized groups. And, and, um, you know, and these are not very complicated to demonstrate, right? These seemingly obvious kinds of things. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have a huge number of you know, systems on a daily basis that we talk about, which, for example, do everything from target advertisements to teenagers who are particularly depressed or have low body confidence, uh, systems that are optimized to, to spread conspiracy theories to those most likely to believe them, uh, systems that are designed and implemented based on a history of racist pseudoscience and so on. And so this was, you know, this didn't require, it didn't require much to persuade me that this is a very important topic. And, uh, and what was really exciting was that we were given the opportunity by the department to create a mandatory module for computer scientists. Um, just a little bit of background for our depart about our department. So our undergraduate program in computer science um, is currently ranked top of the world by subject in the one of the rankings, you know, these rankings, they, uh, this one's the Times Higher Education one. It's a, but, you know, overall, it's a, just a very competitive, highly competitive program um, with a very strong theoretical emphasis. But what's interesting here is that it's not just computer science. We have uh, three different um, courses, and one of them is actually a joint program, computer science and philosophy. Uh, and another one is maths and computer science. But regardless of which of these streams you're on, you are required to take our new module. So this set up a very exciting uh, opportunity for Helena and myself to try to interest students, get, ex get students interested and excited about, uh, about ethical challenges and, and to give them a means by which they can think of them. So our main goal was to prepare students to be able to one, identify, and two, start to think about and address real world ethical challenges that are articulated by digital systems. And in order to do that, um, this is, you know, this is Oxford and we're not, af we're not afraid of embracing our tradition. Uh, we wanted to equip students with the foundational conceptual frameworks for thinking about um, ethical positions. And for that, you know, we did not hold back on ancient philosophy uh, as, you know, in order to establish this foundation. And then we wanted to relate those, we wanted to connect those to contemporary ethical challenges. Um, and then finally to apply them um, to uh, situations as Helena just described. Um, and in order to do that, we were able to draw from a huge variety of, of text, texts that have been recently written on ethical challenges. Um, and we'll revisit those in a bit, but Weapons of Math Destruction, Invisible Women, and Benja uh, Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology were three of the books that we uh, found extremely useful. Now, I, well, this slide might get me in quite a bit of trouble. However, one thing we really wanted to avoid doing was, you, you must understand, so, so just going back for a second, we only had four lectures and two practicals to so do this very compressed. The problem is undergraduates here are very stressed out and they are required to take a lot of classes their first year. And so adding a mandatory module in their schedule is not an easy thing to do. And so we had to really, really figure out a way that we could compress this material in a way that was still meaningful and engaging. So something had to go. And the thing that we decided had to go were the, the most common kinds of, of tropes associated with AI ethical challenges. Now, what's particularly funny is that these three challenges are uh, very championed or, 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 or in fact, they come from uh, Oxford's uh, various philosophers. Um, and Professor Nick Bostrom's uh, superintelligence uh, book, for example, describes the superintelligence hypothesis, which states that at some point, uh, AI might become out of control and, and vastly more capable than humans and thus will not need to keep us around. Um, and uh, the, of course, the trolley problem uh, is perhaps the most well-known ethical uh, conundrum or, or uh, problem in, in history, which states the question of 
it, we need to be able to solve the, the question of whether what the value of a human life or several humans' lives are uh, re, um, in order to determine whether, you know, in order to determine how a system should behave. So if a trolley were out of control um, and it needed to uh, either sacrifice one person or, or several people and they had different properties and histories, which would it choose and how can you make such a decision? And finally, the third thing that we didn't talk about um, more more than more than just describing the problem, um, are the is of course the issue of robot rights and uh, information ethics, uh, which Professor Floridi and others have talked about whether information itself should exert a moral claim, uh, and uh, and thus whether technical systems comprised of information themselves should exert moral claims. The interesting, the reason why we didn't talk about these is that they don't currently present uh, pressing issues to worry about. And in some cases, uh, many of us in the computer science department don't believe they ever will present uh, issues worth worrying about. Sorry, it, worth is a strong word, um, you know, that, that, is, that is relevant to actual uh, problems. Um, they're very interesting questions to discuss. If you'd like to know more about why I don't believe the superintelligence hypothesis uh, will ever uh, occur in reality, uh, please uh, see these scholars who are, who can articulate them, the, the, pro, the, the reasons vastly better than I can. As far as the, the, um, the trolley problem is concerned, we discussed it briefly. I think one of the most um, misapplied versions of the trolley problem is in terms, in the context of autonomous vehicles. And, and so you've probably heard that in order to create autonomous vehicles, we're going to need to solve the trolley problem so that the car can decide whether or not to kill uh, person X or maim some other person Y. Um, in fact, those who are designing safety critical systems and autonomous vehicles here and elsewhere will tell you that the trolley problem is definitely not anything close to anything they worry about. Because as soon as you injure or hurt somebody, the system is outside the scope, it has, it has failed, right? You design systems not to kill people by any means possible. And as soon as you're in that space, then you're in a sort of an error failure condition and you need to cope with that in a particular way. Um, on the other hand, there are some really compelling and also you know, tragic applications of the trolley problem, which we did discuss. And one of them is very relevant right now with the pandemic, critical resource allocation and medical ethics to say, say that you've got a finite number of ICU beds and you have more people who need them. How do you then provision uh, and assign patients to beds? Or then again, as well to disaster relief, hopefully we'll, we won't have another scenario in 2020, at least related to that. So what kinds of problems did we focus on? Well, we focused on it. I wanted to give you a very high level overview because obviously I, I am limited in time here. But one, you know, of course, uh, primary example is what Helena alluded to in terms of algorithmic bias. So it is, you know, it is a fact that voice recognition systems today work better for or have higher accuracy for men um, than for women. And what's really terrible about this is that this can get be cascaded on if you have systems that rely on speech recognition as the first stage of their pipeline. For example, the kind of AI hiring systems that Helena alluded to that require essentially, you know, an understanding of, of what a person is saying in order to make a decision whether somebody is a good candidate uh, will then automatically have higher error rates for women. And this is particularly the problem because, you know, women are already uh, facing, you know, great challenges, greater challenges than men in getting um, you know, through, uh, you know, glass ceilings and, and in order in getting hired, um, especially in particular sectors. And, you know, this kind of thing only makes matters worse. Um, and it's particular, and if you then look at gr groups that have um, accents um, or, you know, uh, a, any other variation in speech, um, then the recognition rates become significantly worse. And you think about how those variations then correlate with marginalized groups already, uh, these systems are, are only gonna make things worse. So we, we talked specifically about things like that, about accuracy uh, uh, related to the groups. A fundamentally different kind of harm that we also described were representational harms, which deal with um, with, with essentially the ways that, that, that people, places, and ideas are then associated 
through uh, the data that we use. For example, Professor Latanya Sweeney's research that revealed that African-American sounding names were more likely to be associated with ads suggesting arrest in Google uh, very much demonstrated the sort of representational harm that these African-American names should be associated in some sense with, uh, with arrests. And, and um, this was, uh, you know, sort of, um, um, uh, the kind of thing that we were talking about. Um, I'm going to skip very quickly through uh, some of the other other lessons um, because I, I would like to get immediately to our um, discussion of reflections. So um, let me see, sorry about that. I think I was slightly ambitious in terms of, of what I could cover in time. Um, another the, the sort of the penultimate thing I'd like to talk about before I talk about reflections was the question of whether art technological artifacts could be unethical or ethical. And for this question, um, I believe that, you know, Milo talked about value embedded design. We, it was very useful for us to talk about the many kinds of systems that computer science students and engineers, um, you know, use on a daily basis and, and talk about whether we could see them as, uh, you know, as ethically neutral general purpose or whether they are in some sense good or bad um, and that was a, that was a, a, a uh, very um, exciting exercise because it related to a lot of the kinds of activities they performed on a daily basis okay so um, now I'd like to just spend a couple minutes at the end um, talking about um, how this went uh, so um, now this this the information diagram is not based on actual figures. This is based upon my sort of recollection and heuristics. So I'd like to say semi-random figures representing a subset of the students with particular reaction to ethics material. So there were there were uh, there was first of all a significant group which were which were really sort of ready for this already. They were already aware and motivated to look at ethical challenges. And really, you know, this was the group that was like, it was like giving water to a sponge. They were ready to, to get this material and start working immediately. And we were very, you know, they were the least difficult to convince, very excited. Um, and essentially all we were doing is providing um, examples which, you know, broadened uh, their initial expectations in general. A majority of the students were not in that group though. While there were a significant number in that group, the majority of the students started, um, seemed to start out with a slightly more reluctant and skeptical view. And I'll talk about in the next slide about why that might be. Because in part, they started with much narrower expectations of what ethics would talk about. Um, and you know, there was a bit of element of surprise when we started talking about the breadth of the kinds of issues that this discussed. Um, and it felt a little bit like they were navigating this sort of local maxima and we were really trying to push them to a place that they were, they were able to see the large picture. But then we had the last group. Now the last group, which is a minority, but nonetheless, I think an important minority, were the highly skeptical students. Um, First of all, they're the students that, you know, when you say you need to take this class, they are the ones that are saying, do I really need to? Um, you know, again, why, why is this anything related to what, what? And I'd like to call them the tricky 20%. So the tricky 20%, why were they so tricky? Um, well, one the way that we dealt with the trickiness, one of, first of all, is that they saw ethics as impinging on their primary, their, their activities. They saw, and what it's very useful, so, it, for us to frame ourselves as in within groups, as computer scientists, why you want a hacker on your team is that then you can actually describe your, you can connect to them as a, as a mentor rather than an interloper, rather than somebody who is introducing ethics as something that you need to do, almost as parents would tell somebody that they need to clean their room. It's much more useful to have a friend just shame you based upon how dirty your room is. But another reason is that is, is language. So it's very important to be able to, for the for this tough 20%, speak the language. Um, and, uh, and that can be very challenging because, um, you know, interdisciplinary work inherently deals with different definitions of things. Um, and even the use of the term, for example, AI, um, imprecisely, which is notoriously done by the media, can be a dead giveaway that you really don't know the systems work very well. And that can put people off. They can put students off of saying, okay, here are these people, they don't know what they're talking about, and they're telling me what I can do or what I can't do. 
Um, but the, and another, but more positive say, uh, effort of being a hacker or computer science, having computer scientists on your team, is that there are some really deep and profound connections between theoretical AI, theoretical CS, and philosophy. And what's great is that you know, we have something like 15, 20% of our students are CS and philosophy students, and being able to make those beautiful connections is very valuable. Um, Next, you want to have a hacker because you need to understand the hacker mindset. So, you know, the hacker mindset originally, Mark Zuckerberg, is to move fast and break things, right? No noobs allowed. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to set the poise of the work so that you're not the fun police telling people what not to do, but instead you're setting the bar higher. You're introducing a bunch of new challenges that will make your life um, perhaps more challenging in the short term, but will allow you to build better things in the future. Um, and so uh, so that is is why, uh, so that's those are sort of the, the feelings that we got and the, the reasons that we were able to pivot um, with our multidisciplinary team between the more computer science angle and more of a philosophy and social science angle. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have, Peter. Do I have a, a one or two minutes left or? Oh. Uh, sorry, you're muted at the moment, but um, <laughs> um, if, you could, I, I mean, if you could bring things to a reasonably quick conclusion, it would be okay. nice to have a quarter of an hour for general questions. Uh, okay, so sorry if about you that. could finish within uh, three or four more minutes. Yes, absolutely. That's more than enough time. So, um, so, so an example of the kinds of uh, sort of interesting and rich and slightly tense discussions that we had among students, which may, which made me realize that you know we're definitely our jobs are definitely not done, and there's a lot of opportunity here to improve things. Is are the following? I give you three examples. The first one is that we were in the middle of discussing a paper which was called "Discriminating Tastes," which is about Uber customer ratings and the ways that. For example, women and minority drivers get on average lower Uber Lyft ratings than, than white men. This is in general to, uh, perceived or, or thought to be the case for a lot of gig economy workers and is of course, a, you know, a problem because then it feeds into the algorithm which then changes the opportunities that are given to the gig workers um, as a consequence. So it has this vicious feedback cycle. So we were discussing this case and, you know, uh, we had a student say, well, you know, how do you know that this is because that people are being biased and that women are, or minorities are just not worse drivers than men? And uh, the nice thing about uh, this class is that we were very open to having it as a seminar and we had somebody immediately respond, well, do you know that women have better accident records? So they have fewer accidents than men. So the evidence would suggest the opposite, that in fact, maybe women were better drivers in general. Um, and then we had another student respond that, you know, these are again paraphrases, they're not direct quote. We had another student respond that was so maybe, you know, they just drive more slowly or, 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 or just too careful or aren't as nice to passengers or something really. And what I wanted to highlight here is that this is a real challenge because, um, because they're trying to statistically explain the possibility that there may have been another reason besides discrimination that led these groups to have uh, lower ratings, you try to slice away the possibility, the infinite possibilities that there may be yet another reason that maybe it wasn't racism, maybe it wasn't discrimination. And this is a trap, right? This is a challenge because, and what, and I think that one of the, the ways that we can get around this is really by saying, well, you know, the, the personal experience of people um, who are a member of these groups uh, will be able to, you know, tell you and amplify that in fact, you know, when uh, the, the kinds of ways that they get treated and the ways that they get rated, uh, it suggests discrimination rather than one of these, you know, increasingly unlikely other hypotheses. Um, and that kind of discussion is, is really interesting and, and fruitful and, and will allow uh, these things to pan out. You know, we, again, so we want to not erase discrimination statistically. Um, and so it's, and it's often difficult to, to rein this argument in. Uh, two other very quick uh, examples, and this one kept coming up over and over again in an AI hiring scenario, was the diversity quality fallacy. So it goes something like this. We have to consider diversity, but that'll force us to sacrifice the quality of our candidates. When you screen candidates, you generate an end best list and, and, you know, and if you want to, and if those top candidates are all of, for example, white men, then you're going to have to keep going down the list until you find a candidate that meets your diversity criteria. 
And we found several students hit, giving this argument over and over again. Um, and the, the point that broke that was very exciting was when we had students respond to this very strongly, strongly and say, for example, well, what are you measuring anyway? What is the ranking supposed to represent? You can't measure the value of diversity to a team. And then another student gave another really exciting point, which was, was the law of diminishing returns. Above a certain threshold, she said, rank differences will mostly like be, likely be caused by noise and other things like historical injustices and, in, and structural inequalities. Um, and so, you know, that kind of being able to, for those students to counter that argument, I think, was extremely exciting. Uh, the, um, oh, and the third and final one that I wanted to mention was that so engineers will be engineers, no matter what you do to them. And they'll try to, they, they believe genuinely that you can fix it um, if it's broken, you know. Whereas um, we, you know, we strongly believe and we try to highlight that the, in some cases that some systems are so deeply problematic fundamentally by their principles that they should never have been built to begin with. And, uh, and so we gave a number of examples of this, um, you know, deep nude, uh, skin the skin whitening app, uh, sexual assault simulator. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things are examples which draw on historical uh, racist pseudoscience. For example, there's a huge number of papers that are being produced by machine learning um, researchers right now to that try to infer uh, traits such as IQ, criminality, or sexual orientation from their faces. Of course, uh, this roots, you know, is rooted in physiognomy, uh, which is a, a long-standing racist tradition of trying to identify whether people might be criminals by how they look. Um, and without that context, though, students may be prone to try to throw deep neural networks at everything. Um, and what the really the aha moment was where students uh, realized that in fact, maybe the features that these these deep neural networks were were triggering on were the features that that you know that society has forced people to uh, to fit. It was essentially they were overfitting on on features um, that we really shouldn't be using for determine these for determining characteristics like these. Um, well, I just want to end by saying there's a lovely uh, um, GitHub uh, by uh, David Dow, uh, which is a compilation of things that should never be built. Um, and in conclusion, um, the first year of ethics and responsible innovation showed us um, a bit about how CS students think about ethics. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, we there's there's no singular textbook that's being used. We were able to draw together a lot of materials from a different lot of different uh, contemporary sources that are very good. Uh, but we sort of had to bring together um, bits and pieces of each. And I think the next thing we need to do is really understand um, how to uh, to to uh, help students through some of these tough traps uh, that they might encounter in the process. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Max. Uh, really interesting. Um, right. Well, are all our speakers now available? One, what I'd like to do is kick off with a question that's been asked. Um, and it's prompted partly by what you've just said, Max, the, uh, the constraints of the undergraduate curriculum and how difficult it is to fit ethics teaching into it. The question Ideally, what kinds of ethics pedagogy and how much of it should an engineering or a computer science student encounter during their undergraduate education? Um, and a, a, another question made this point, another question that made this point that actually a lot of these issues will arise with uh, engineering students as well as uh, computer science or AI students. And, uh, are there specific issues? This is from Leslie. Uh, what do you think about teaching ethics to engineering students as they also have that need? And maybe you'd like to comment on how much ethics should we get, be getting into those courses? And is there a distinction between engineering students and software engineering or AI students? Who would, um, who'd like to volunteer first on that? Helena? Yeah, go um, ahead. Yes, yeah, so I'm actually a, a social scientist. So I studied um, 
social and political sciences for my undergraduate degree. And, and what's interesting is that in that curriculum, we start learning ethics from day one. So we learn it in relation to, to research methods and so on. So it always surprises me to, to be in a computer science department where you don't have that kind of attitude. You know, ethics isn't kind of embedded into everything that you do. So, so for the question about, you know, how much ethics and, and how soon, I would say teach ethics from day one teach it as a fundamental part because it could it is and you know we see all of the examples that max has just talked about this is why it's so important that we're teaching ethics to our computer scientists and to our engineers um, right from day one and teaching it as something that is fundamental to everything that they're doing it's not just sort of like an add-on thing that you have to get through but actually it's integrated and i think moving forward what we would like to see um are these ethical elements so, so we teach it as its own course but also seeing it integrated into other modules or seeing it sort of students being challenged to think about it in other modules and other activities that they're doing we already have it in in our department in in year two they have to do a, a practical design challenge and, and now the students have to think about ethical issues there so there is a sense of it of it building up um, through the curriculum and I think the key is to, to keep that going and, and, and to keep getting these issues sort of embedded into what the students are doing and I think actually it's the the stuff about AI in it that really helps sell it to our computer science students because I think again because of the kind of computer science that studied at Oxford sometimes there can be an attitude oh it's for the it's for the engineers you know it's the implementation that it's the issue but it actually it's all of the examples that, that Max talked about that really I think helped open um, our students eyes to why we need to think about it in computer science like why it's actually you know in the algorithms themselves and it's the way that they're developed and the data that they're working on and so on. But it's going to give rise to a challenge, isn't it? Because co computer science has grown so much, and AI in particular, in recent years. I mean, I, I know I, I spent 20 years partly in a computer science department, and you know, whenever the curriculum was being revised, <laughs> there was lots of new stuff, and <laughs> there was this competition. How, how, what can you? What do you have to lose from the curriculum to make space? And if m most of your faculty are people who who aren't really used to thinking of ethics as part of the discipline, uh, that, that's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, no. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Nods of agreement, but <laughs> no easy I think, solution, I guess. Milo, do you want Yeah, I, I just think that that way of putting it, and, and what Helena said also, also kind of pushes into this, that way of putting it is very fruitful, is like, what is part of the discipline? What does it, what counts as a good computer scientist? And if what counts as a good computer scientist is a certain technical or mathematical aptitude, then yeah, the other things are going to come second and it's going to get crowded out. You're not, you're not optimizing for the problem of how to teach them to be a certain kind of, you know, ethically responsible. But if we think of what counts as a good computer scientist, at least for the purposes of our education, as integrating these components, then that's just one of the things that we're trying to teach. Um, and then it becomes like anything else, you know, we're balancing whether, you know, more theoretical aspects of computer science versus more applied, you're doing machine learning versus not, there's always going to be a trade-off in what content, but we do, I do think that that's like the fundamental shift to think about a good computer scientist or a good engineer more generally as not just having technical aptitude. And once we have that shift, other things can follow. Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, go on, Max. Can I just say um, two very quick things? Um, uh, you know, one to also uh, reinforce what um, what Helena said about um, it, it was really exciting to be able to get the students in their first year to talk about this to establish uh, you know a framing. And what's interesting is that the deontological ideas um, really sort of supported for some a feeling that people had. You know, that the, there were some things that were sort of bad to do, like, you know, there's sort of this gut feeling that there were some things that were just bad, but they didn't know that there was a term for it. And they didn't know that there was like a principle that said actually, you know, violating someone's privacy, you know, and, you know, a right to like to treat somebody genuinely rather than to try to, you know, use them to, you know, sell more things or for engagement to, to be more engaged was like, you know, a violation of something that was a fundamental, you know, right that, that, that people have talked about humans having. So that we were hoping by sort of capturing them at the beginning that they would then be able to have that, that structure that they were able to then apply that lens to whatever they were looking at. But that being said, the second thing I wanted to say was that there's a lot of really domain specific 
uh, applied ethics that we could go into. So the first thing we talked about, we said, have any, has anybody even written a line of code before? Of course, most people had in the computer science program. So did you decide to put it up online? Was that okay? What, you know, so there's the fundamental questions of the potential harms that your code might do, you know, so the f basic ethics, like this is basic, like, you know, the fact that something you're doing in the world can have unexpected consequences and, you know, should you be responsible for those things versus something that's highly domain specific, like is scraping data off the web for your machine learning algorithm, you know, that is comprised, you know, of data that people don't know that it's being used for it is, you know, is that okay? Um, so there are lots of very specific kinds of things that I think um, it'd be interesting to return to, and for example, you know, AI or machine learning ethics, I think should be its own course. Um, and it should probably be, to, you know, towards the end, towards where the students are actually doing advanced machine learning um, to be, you know, uh, to reinforce those connections, probably. There's actually a, a plan underway. And um, now, now that Milo and, uh, and Carissa, my colleague at, at Hartford College, are on board, uh, the plan is to catch a course on AI ethics, which will be taken by our students doing computer science and philosophy, um, probably compulsorily, but will also be available to others. And I, I think that will be very exciting to see those, those developments. So yeah, and I'm sure you know, comparable things will be happening elsewhere. I want to focus on a different question. There's two questions that have come in that are, that are kind of in a, a similar sort of theme. Uh, so one from Alison, how do you integrate ethics into a graduate program like Oxford's, where students are more likely to work on ethically questionable projects without the time to devote to an ethics class? Okay, I mean, I, my quick response is, I, I think graduates ought to have more time for an ethics class rather than less because a graduate course gives lots of time for reflection. But the main, the main issue here is that they could be working on ethically questionable projects. And a related question, your discussion has focused on decisions that students might make as individuals when they create technology. But we know that it's often bigger forces, incentive structures, corporate cultures, that are the real culprits when technologies have bad effects. What does your ethics pedagogy have to do with that? And that that's, so if you if focus, focus on the incentive here, there are a lot of financial incentives to do unethical things. The student you're teaching may have the best motives in the world, but when they go out into the job market, they come under a lot of, a lot of pressure. And maybe even, God forbid, when they get <laughs> pressured by academics for whom they're doing their research. I, I hope that would be less of a problem. But. Milo, do you want to have a go at this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe two parts of it. Um, one is how this fits within the education itself and the sort of like more structural view, thinking about organizational incentives, you know, the, the move fast and break things culture of Silicon Valley that like that Max alluded to. Um, one part of it, I think, is having these elements from social sciences and the areas of the humanities that look at kind of these things to teach students that the, how this is going on. Why doesn't, you know, why might Facebook do things that are unethical? Well, they have a fiduciary duty. It's part of their charter to make money. So to get students to understand that, to get students to, to, to see those kinds of things, also not to be super deterministic about it, um, to see that things like corporate culture and how you set up a team if you're working with other people, these all things can have effects, but to get them to appreciate and not just to have an individualist view. So that's sort of like on the structural question. And then there's this other question of how do you motivate the students to not just do the bad thing once they leave? That's a really hard question. And that's kind of this idea of the, the, the slogan I was using is like ready and willing. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, it's gonna be context dependent, it's gonna take work and it's really hard to measure, but there are lots of different ways. Like, you know, maybe the, it sounds like, you know, some of the talking about Helena and Max have success with teaching parts of moral theory to show students that their intuitions have theoretical backing. 
And then that makes them take ethics more seriously or just gets them to see that they have a certain power over the ethical outcomes in like these small decisions that they're making. That might be exciting to them. We just have to explore, I think, there. Thank you. Helena? Yeah, I think the, um, so the first question about um, graduate students. Uh, so if the, if the system for the graduate student education is working properly, then there are various places where it can be picked up if they're, they're doing something that could be ethically harmful. So obviously they have the relationship with their supervisors. Um, they have internal examinations as they go through uh, the stages of their career where these things can be picked up as well. They also have opportunities to take courses in their first year of graduate study too. And a lot of them do take um, some of the ethics oriented courses when they take it. Um, and we do, I think, uh, has been a really helpful development in our department over the last couple of years is that we have our own research ethics committee now so that if you're doing work that involves human participants it goes for an ethics check within the department whereas previously it was having to go to the social sciences research ethics committee and, and it's, it makes a big difference because actually we we need to have these Oops. ah no dear you okay Hello, I'm back. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I said something and <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's oh, didn't mean to be. But, um, but I was gonna say it, it's very important that I think that, that people's work in computer science is, is checked by people who have the expertise to, to know about the ethical dimensions of, of the technical work um, that they're doing. So I think there are various developments, various safeguards that we have in place that if they all work properly, then their protections uh, against our, our graduate students who are more independent in, in their work, which I think was where the, the question was coming from. We do have those sort of protections in place. Yeah. And I think the question about sort of individuals and incentives is a really important one. And it's one that some of our students raise as well and say, well, what's the point of me being ethical if I go and work for this big company and what they're doing is sort of deeply unethical. And we try to to raise it in the discussions in the sessions where we talked about sort of codes of practice um, and the responsible innovation perspective which is much more sort of society based where you might think about sort of you know uh, safeguards and responsibility practices that could be embedded within organizations it could be in the form of um, self-governance that industries might put in place their own codes of practice or it could be policy dimensions as well so we try to bring out that that wider perspective because it's absolutely true you know it's not just down to individual people to make ethical decisions Decisions. It's actually about how these things fit in across society in the various institutions in society as well. I'd like to bring in a couple more questions there. So we've, we've got Richard saying, regarding the skills required for practicing engineers, what about the socio-political skills of asserting and applying ethical thinking when working with people who are less aware or motivated than you are? So, I mean, that's very pertinent here, isn't it? That if, if students from studying ethics can not only uh, get good at thinking about it themselves, but also good at persuading others to take it seriously. And if, if we could wrap that up with an, another couple of questions. Um, from Anna, given how ubiquitous the problem of replicating structural inequalities seems to be in AI, why is the sector so quiet about its role in these issues? How is the sector ensuring accountability. And related to that, do the speakers have any reflections on the decolonization process of ethical algorithms? How can the industry's creators ensure marginalized communities are reflected in the creation of these algorithms? So there's a, there's a few issues there, but they're obviously closely related. If each of you could just quickly say, give your two penneth on that, Max. <laughs> yes, so really great questions. Um, the first question dealing with the sociopolitical um, issues are, are also um, exacerbated by the cultural dimension as well. We have had students um, who explicitly say, well, it's okay if women don't have rights, they don't have rights in my country. Um, and, you know, and things like that. And, and the very interesting thing about this is to be able to say, you know, well, you know, we're talking about this context. And for this context, these, these are the kinds of problems for which, you know, you know, in the West or whatever. Um, and so I think it's very important to, to contextualize that. But also, I think that some of the, the more fundamental moral philosophy gives us a lot of foundation or, or ammunition by which one can say, you know, 
people should be treated equally and, and these things. And so I think that was a, that's sort of a, 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 um, a useful thing to say, you know, if you believe these things, then, then, you know, our systems are not in accord with what they're trying to achieve. Um, and so that I think uh, was very useful. What was the, what was the second point? I'm sorry, I'm already. Um, to do with diversity and so forth. Yeah. Diversity. Oh, well, so, so, that is that is that is a hugely um, hugely important problem. Um, and and you know what's interesting is that it's there are really bad ways to go about it and really good ways to go about it. And so right now among so there's a real issue with dealing with information economics. Um, so the most sort of wealthy companies, the biggest you know the power platforms have the resources to and what they're trying to do right now is explicitly take task forces to go collect data on specific intersectional gr uh, groups of you know that are you know in in all around the world they have the money and resource to do this and they're going and targeting to try to improve the overall performance of their AI systems. Uh, smaller companies don't have that kind of resource and they therefore rely on sort of public data sets which have this inherent you know large scale bias and the question is do commercial companies like Google and the other large platforms have a moral imperative to share the sort of data that will allow systems to work more universally with the companies that they're competing with the, these upstarts and stuff so it's it's very much uh, a, an economic problem as well. Yeah yeah and you, you also mentioned the, the issue of uh, companies' obligations. If companies see their obligation as being to maximize shareholder value, uh, that pushes them in one direction. But if actually countries get wise to the fact that they need their companies to adopt a, a broader, uh, broader aims with more stakeholders in mind, that could, could help. Yeah. Helena or Milo, do you want to say a word about Helena? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so this question about how do you persuade others, I've been thinking about it, and it'll be a fantastic task actually for our students to do to kind of role play it out. Imagine you've, you've started working in company X and, and you're aware of all of these algorithmic injustices. How do you persuade your new colleagues of it? And I think it would be a, a wonderful practical challenge that we could set our students and maybe one that they would use uh, when they go into the workforce. Um, and then the questions about uh, structural inequality, um, you know, I, I think that they're so crucial and obviously there's a, a very large awareness of them within AI ethics at the moment about how these inequalities get reproduced uh, through these systems and, and problems of the lack of diversity within data sets and so on. And I think if the industry isn't doing enough, isn't being, isn't doing enough, it's because it doesn't need to at the moment. So, you know, it can still make profit. Um, even whilst this is in place. So in our economic environment, um, there has to be pushback for them to, to make the change. And I think we have seen some successes, um, you know, in, in ICT with, you know, social media platforms being held to account and, and making changes based on sort of, you know, public disapproval, withdrawal of advertising and so on. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately, uh, we have to find ways to make diversity profitable and, and lack of diversity lose these companies money and that's what will be will change it so it has to be sort of you know uh, pressure coming I think from wider society right yes Milo yeah so on the first point um, of sort of communication and negotiation I love that and I think that that is sort of like one of the skills that you need to have if we're going to affect change. Doesn't So let's say you're really good at identifying ethical issues. You're really motivated to do it, but you can't convince any of your coworkers to do it. So what? <laughs> um, I mean, you have, might have a little impact, but unless you're running the company, it might, it might not be much. Um, yeah, I think again, this is a matter of practice. The kind of thing that Helena talked about is the kind of thing that we've done some, so. Uh, we'll have a problem set where students will have like a decision that they've identified um, and they'll have identified certain stakeholder groups that are adversely effective. And we'll have them like write a Facebook post addressed to that stakeholder group saying like, here's the decision and why. And then we'll ask them to imagine being the stakeholder, reply to Facebook posts and do like a little dialogue back and forth. Exactly the kind of thing that Helena was talking about. So I think one, students need practice and two, students need sort of tools or vocabulary. So in some cases, I agree, that can be the language of moral philosophy. It has a weight behind it, it has a credibility. This isn't just my opinion, um, there, there's, a, there's a there there. Um, and then I think 
the better you can just sort of articulate what's going on, the better, the bigger repertoire you have of cases, the more you know about these things, the more articulate that you are about saying, here's why this is the right choice, because I've thought through the space of possible options, here are our stakeholders, here's how doing this might affect them in this way, or, you know, probably, or here's how going this might affect them in that way. Sort of just having the skill to do that puts you in a better position to advocate for the choice. Um, so I'll leave it there. I know I'm running a little long and I just agree with everything that both Max and Helena said about the, the diversity and inclusion elements. Thank you. Well, we're gonna to have to wrap it up, but I've, we've got one question, a, a, a nice one to finish on, I think. Um, if you can, can each uh, ha ha have a stab at coming up with one example. We've had examples of problematic algorithms but do the speakers have any examples or illustrations of design that is doing ethics well? So let's end on a positive note. Who's going to volunteer to go first? <laughs> I hope the answer is, isn't no. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, well, I, I can come up with an example of something at MIT. It's not, a, it's not an algorithm, but it, it, it connects to this sort of ethical hackathon thing. So there's a project called Make the Breast Pump Not Suck. Um, so it used these methods um, that Helena who talked about Max touched on too, these sort of responsible design, participatory design, where people were getting together and being like, here's my experience with the breast pump, here's what I would need out of it, both from like a financial perspective and from a use perspective, and that resulted in a new prototype that, of the breast pump that's since been developed. So it, I mean, it's like, there's not something inherently wrong with technology. There's a lot we can do and there are a lot of known methods for pushing us towards outcomes that promote social good and don't just sort of act as some sort of guardrail. Thank you. Max? There have been a variety of um, really exciting experiments and experimental efforts in trying to uh, reduce pol polarization on social media that have that are really exciting. Um, you know, things that that allow people to discuss um, in sort of long form why they believe what they believe, rather than to in order to counter the sort of reaction. Um, you know. Uh, driven uh, incentive engineering that we've been exposed to all, all these years. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I won't point to a specific one particular project, but there is a large um, number of, of projects that try to apply information visualization, as well as other sort of techniques to um, ask people to actually spend time, slow down and spend, spend time um, arguing their point. Um, and, and so that they can try to, uh, to try to then counter and discuss things in a more civil way. Um, and I think that that's really, uh, you know, uh, will help Yeah, we us could do with that, especially in America. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Eleanor. Um, yeah, I, I do agree there are various examples. And I think actually the point that Milo was making about the value of, of um, products that are built through participatory design processes. So you, where you bring in users and you try to understand their perspectives and you know their experiences right from the early stages of design can be extremely beneficial for, for producing um, products or systems that promote social good. Um, the example I'm gonna give is, is someone I was talking to uh, just last week who works in robotics and was producing, um, was developing uh, assistive care robots that could, could interact with people, with, with older people in care homes and provide sort of uh, social support and other forms of support. But in this pandemic um, scenario has diverted attention towards a, a very simple cleaning robot that can go into to hospitals and provide cleaning, um, cleaning services to, to assist uh, with infection control in hospitals during the pandemic. So I think that's a very good example. And the robot functions without collecting up any personal data or anything like that. So that's my example. Excellent. Oh, well, that's a nice note to finish on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to, to all of you. That's been a, a fascinating discussion. And it's raised a lot of important issues. Um, the session's been recorded. It's going to be added to what's becoming a very rich resource covering lots of different areas of AI ethics um, that we're building up at Oxford. Uh, if you want to look at those resources, by the way, if you go to the Faculty of Philosophy website and the AI ethics section, that's uh, philosophy.ox.ac.uk slash AI ethics. Uh, you'll find it there. There are also links to it from uh, philocomp.net. That's P H I L O C O M P.net. And if you go to the ethics section there, you'll find links. 
Uh, we're trying to build these up so that over time, the seminars that we've given will become a, a really valuable resource for, for people, uh, both in academia uh, and outside. And I hope that what we've produced today will feed into a much broader discussion um, and will no, will no doubt develop hugely over coming years as we all learn more about the possibilities and problems of applying ethics in AI developments. And in particular, as we've seen today, teaching and promoting such applications. Uh, so thank you again to the speakers. Thank you, Milo. Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Max. That's been a tremendous discussion. Thank you for tuning in, um, and especially those who ask questions. And it's been great in particular to see how some of those questions have, even here now in this session, inspired some fruitful ideas for uh, further development of courses in AI ethics. Look out for our next seminar. That's on Thursday, the 26th of November, uh, same time, same day of the week, uh, five o'clock. And that will be on AI and autonomy. So until then, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Thank you. <laughs>